Welcome to NOAA Central Library's platform for the presentation of ideas, research, and news in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. Today's library seminar, titled Targeted High-Resolution Water Clarity Mapping for Hydrographic Survey Planning in Alaska, is part of the NOAA Innovators Seminar Series, which is put out by the NOAA Technology Partnerships Office. Derek Parks, Deputy Director of the Technology Partnerships Office, will introduce our two speakers, David Flanagan and Ben Page from the company T. Carta. Before we begin, here are a few logistical tips to help you enjoy this presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This usually resets the software and resolves most technical issues. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. We will also be accepting questions throughout the webinar, which David and Ben will address at the end of their presentation. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat box located in your control panel, which is identified by an orange arrow. So with that last comment, please join us for the presentation. The mic is yours, Eric. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Lisa. I appreciate it. Uh, as Lisa said, I'm the Deputy Director of the Technology Partnerships Office in NOAA. And uh, the purpose behind these programs, the Innovator Series, was really to highlight uh, innovation that's happening both within NOAA and outside of NOAA with our small business partners. So uh, within NOAA, we have a lot of scientists and engineers who are developing wonderfully innovative products, and we hope to highlight a few of them uh, in the coming months. Uh, but in the interim period, we have uh, a number of very creative small businesses that are doing wonderful work that's related to NOAA's mission uh, through the Small Business Innovation Research Program. So for those of you who don't, do not know, the SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Program, is a two-phase competitive uh, grant program that's run across the federal government. Uh, but within NOAA, we have our own specific program uh, with phase one being dedicated to coming up with a uh, basic project plan and uh, the idea for what innovation they want to develop. And then phase two, which is a longer period, uh, two-year period, that is funded to come up with a prototype for an invention uh, or a, a technology. And so once we get through the two phases of the SBIR, we reach the, the critical phase of uh, transitioning into phase three, which is commercialization. And so the, the difficulties of getting from a prototype to commercial sale are numerous. And uh, our SBIR program wants to do as much as we can to help the companies get the most out of the investment that the taxpayer has made in their technology. And so that is one reason why we want to feature them here uh, on the Innovator Series. Just so everybody knows, uh, these technologies for, for federal procurement, I should say, are available for a, um, a sole source procurement. So there is a streamlined process for actually procuring an SBIR technology because the company has already gone through two phases of competition with the federal government. So it is a very convenient way if you are interested in a technology to get it on board fairly quickly. So with that background, I will introduce our two speakers today. We have, uh, first of all, David Flanagan. Um, who is going to, well, actually, let me step back and just say David Flanagan and Ben Page are going to talk about T-Carta and how they provide uh, rapid high resolution surface water monitoring for the mitigation of unknowns for future hydrographic survey and planning. Um, those of you in the hydrographic survey field of work will understand all of the, the details about that. It's, it's certainly over my head, but I'm gonna let them explain it to me. Um, David Flanagan leads the Marine Remote Sensing Program at T-Carta uh, in research and development and commercial production efforts. He joined T-Carta about two and a half years ago after completing his MS in Environmental Studies at the College of Charleston, beautiful place. And he will be joined today by Ben Page. And I'm gonna let uh, David introduce Ben and give you a little bit of uh, information about him as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to these fine gentlemen and let them tell you about T-Carta and their technology. Awesome, thank you, Derek. Um, yeah, as, as you said, um, my name is David Flanagan. I'm on the Marine Remote Sensing Program Coordinator at T-Carta, and today I've got with me uh, Ben Page, who's a remote sensing analyst um, at T-Carta. 
Uh, Ben's been with us for about a year now. Um, he's got a, a, a large background in, in uh, research and optical um, water quality parameters and specifically in inland lakes and then also coastal areas. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about, um, excuse me, let me make these uh, go away real quick. Let me go back slide. Uh, a little bit about some of the research that we've done for phase one of our NOAA Small Business Innovation Research Grant. Um, and then we've actually just started in the last couple of months uh, phase two of our, our, our research grant. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, these technologies and products that we've developed um, are going to move forward uh, within that phase two. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of kind of what we've done, um, we, we're going to talk a little bit about the motivations for uh, of creating these water clarity products for specifically for Alaska. Um, and then how, we, how we've kind of gone through that process internally uh, with different satellite uh, providers and satellite data types, um, and then how we plan to use this data um, as a service and a product, um, both in a uh, machine learning uh, predictive model of sorts, and then also as a tool um, for rapid uh, water clarity uh, data production within um, something such as an RGIS Pro uh, toolbox. Um, so just quickly about us at T-Carta, uh, we're based in Denver, Colorado. Um, our primary product uh, currently is satellite-derived bathymetry, or SDB, um, and it, all the geospatial and hydrographic uh, kind of uh, services um, and capabilities that surround that. Um, you know, in the past, we've completed uh, contracts for both NOAA um, and uh, UK Hydrographic Office. We also currently have uh, uh, another SBIR uh, grant that's currently in phase two for the National Science Foundation um, that's in, in process currently, and that's focused on global satellite drive bathymetry, calibrated and validated with the ISAT 2 satellite. Um, and then within that, we've also uh, produced an RGIS Pro toolbox, um, geoprocessing toolbox that hosts a, a number of tools um, for that satellite drive bathymetry. Um, and so that'll fit in a little bit um, with, with what we're planning to do with this water clarity mapping uh, services and products down the road. Um, so a little bit of motivation behind uh, of, you know, really why, why do we want to produce these water clarity products in Alaska? Um, I'm sure as many of you are aware, back in uh, November of 2019, there's a presidential mem memo that went out um, to survey uh, the US EEZ um, with specific attention uh, to uh, the Alaskan coastline. Um, so, you know, our first step was, you know, we, we took a look at, uh, you know, the current NOAA bathymetric data that was available. Um, and, you know, there's obviously uh, some gaps in that survey data. Um, and for good reason, as you can see on the bottom right there, it's a highly dynamic area, you know, from a surface view, it seems like it's either, uh, you know, half the year, it's or more than half the year, in some regions it's covered in ice and then the rest of the ice is melting, created, creating these turbidity plumes. So it's a, it's a highly dynamic area and a really tough area for surveying. Um, and so, you know, we, we kind of came up with a, a lot of the ideas for this phase one several years ago, but it, you know, the, these, uh, these needs are still, still there today. Um, in the bottom left, I've, I've shown two panels from uh, the third Alaska coastal mapping summit um, back in December that specifically address you know, water clarity needs in Alaska, as well as the, um, you know, the need for satellite direct bathymetry options there as well uh, to help map the entirety of the coastline. So as I mentioned, we, we produce a lot of satellite derived bathymetry. Um, this is an example of something that we have, uh, of a feasibility study that we did in Alaska, um, looking for areas uh, where we could produce satellite derived bathymetry. Um, and, you know, it, as I mentioned before, it's a highly dynamic area um, and it's difficult for satellite to have Um And then on the right here we have, um, it's a white ribbon around Alaska, uh, but you know, it, it's, a, it's a big opportunity um, for us um, to be able to uh, map these areas using satellite drive bathymetry or provide information um, so that others can do that in the field. Um, so, like the, the figure says, over 600,000 square kilometers of area of natural waters in Alaska that equates to something like oh, 32,000 miles of coastline uh, in Alaska. So, there's obviously a big opportunity for this. Um, so, you know, one of the first things we did when we were, we were looking at, at Alaska is we, we went to the NOAA Water Clarity Web Map, uh, which is a, an awesome resource um, for looking at 
you know, long-term averages, uh, monthly averages in water clarity um, in some of these regions in Alaska. Uh, specifically, it's derived from the Sentinel-3 Olchi sensor um, at 300 meter resolution, and it's a measure of the diffuse attenuation coefficient, or KD. Um, and essentially, that is a measure of water clarity, and it's related to the concentration of scattering particles in the water column. And, you know, this was really helpful for us to get get started in that, you know, we, we could look for areas um, or time frames for which we could evaluate imagery for satellite derived this imagery. Um, but, you know, for us, we were looking to uh, potentially see if we could uh, increase uh, the, uh, the spatial resolution of this to get a little bit more targeted um, in these areas. Um, and then also, you know, uh, ideally keep the same, uh, you know, revisit time that the Sentinel-3 satellite has, which is every every day or every other day in some of these regions in Alaska. Um, so what we did is we, we looked at the, uh, the NOAA Plan Hydrographic Survey projects for the next several years, and we took some of those um, specifically for 2021 is what we wanted to focus on. Um, and we looked at those, specifically these two um, in the Bristol Bay area, um, and we were happy to see last week uh, that, you know, at the Hydrographic Services Review Panel, um, that these are still planned for this coming year. So it's really exciting to see that, you know, some of our, our work can potentially, something that we can uh, potentially compare to some of those survey results. Um, so for, for the kind of purposes of, of this uh, presentation, we're going to focus on this Bristol Bay area um, a little bit. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do is to get that Sentinel-3 Ulchi data in-house, uh, just to try to provide us a little bit more flexibility so that we were able to recreate um, some of those average uh, monthly time series, like some of the NOAA web map. Um, but we were able to break that down a little bit further for us into weekly rolling averages to try and get at maybe specific weeks where we could see uh, good imagery for satellite derived bathymetry or, again, how that could be applied to a hydrographic survey. Um, so, as you can see, it's a little bit more noisy um, than would a uh, you know a monthly average would be. Um, but again, that that comes back to there's less images um, that we're averaging in in these in these data bins, and and this is um, uh, an image of Bristol Bay, uh, Alaska, and you can see these are those two um, on the left and the right proposed uh, hydrographic survey projects for uh, that NOAA will carry out um, this year. Um, so we went from from the Sentinel three uh, product, and we were you know we we're thinking to ourselves, for us, we really need something that's a little bit higher resolution um, to kind of get at uh, some of the some of the questions and answers that we have that we want to find. Um, so as I mentioned, Sentinel three, we can provide those weekly rolling averages at three hundred meters in those Arctic regions, like um, or subarctic regions like Alaska. Um, and so we we moved to Sentinel two, um, and we were what we were able to do is provide. Uh, or create weekly snapshots um, of uh, of water clarity. Um, and in this case, we're we're producing particle backscatter. Um, and Ben will, uh, will talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes and kind of our scientific basis behind that. Um, but with these Sentinel Sentinel images, uh, the revisit times three to five days, so we're you know uh, not nearly as as much temporal coverage as Sentinel three, but we do get that higher resolution. Um, product as you can see see in this bottom left panel here um, and then just for comparison's sake that uh, that bottom right panel is from uh, that NOAA uh, topobathy data viewer web map of the the diffuse attenuation coefficient um, so you can see it's a little bit higher resolution um, coming from sentinel 2 um, but again both of these are limited uh, by weather clouds and and you know again this water quality is highly dynamic in these areas um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ben to talk a little bit more about uh, our water clarity algorithms and some of the scientific basis for some of these things that, 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 we're, that I'm talking about currently. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, so um, several satellite-derived water clarity algorithms exist in the literature, and um, we evaluated a few here, uh, demonstrated uh, just sort of some different ways on how water clarity can be measured and interpreted. Um, so overall, we found that, uh, you know, common water clarity indices such as turbidity um, and secchi depth uh, perform well on multispectral satellite imagery such as Sentinel-2 um, in terms of capturing sort of the spatial and temporal phenology of surface water conditions. Um, however, when these models are applied to 
without valid in situ data, uh, the estimated value of the index can be you know, orders of magnitude uh, from the actual measurements that might have been made on the ground. Um, it's usually because these uh, literature cited uh, models are, uh, you know, calibrated regionally uh, and require routine in situ uh, measurements for consistent model accuracy. Um, so another way to measure surface water conditions, uh, what we did in-house is sort of uh, through modeling the inherent optical properties or IOPs using analytical algorithms. Um, in this case, the backscatter due to suspended particles in the water column are estimated as a unitless intensity rescaled from zero to one. Uh, this sort of allows us to evaluate the variable surface waters uh, within a specific AOI, and thus it doesn't really require uh, any in situ uh, data for validation. Um, further, this index can be estimated for uh, all multispectral bands and not just a single, not just at a single wavelength. Um, and it doesn't just return a single value for evaluation. So for example, on the left-hand side there, you see a time series of uh, the particle backscatter or BBP from Sentinel-2 over Galvin Lagoon at 664 nanometers or the red band, but you can easily um, acquire this uh, in the blue band or the other three red edge bands available at Sentinel-2. So in phase one, we actually uh, evaluated the performance of the backscatter index in several bay areas in Alaska uh, to sort of inspect the range, the variability, and uh, the spatial temporal phenology of the surface waters in these highly dynamic areas. Um, and in phase two, we've already started, you know, sort of archiving these pixel-based uh, backscatter intensities from Sentinel-2 for each upcoming survey AOI uh, in 2021, as Dave had mentioned. These sort of time series data sets will be plugged in with other hydrological information specific to the AOI uh, in machine learning models to help forecast for, you know, feasibility uh, for feasible hydrographic survey conditions on the NOAA side, and also for optimal image testing uh, for satellite drive bathymetry on the T-CARTA side. Um, and Dave will touch a bit more on this later. Um, so while Sentinel-2 has the capacity to provide an overview of some of the surface water dynamics in Alaska coastal areas, um, major difficulty, as David covered, is the lack of sort of clear quality imagery in the Arctic region. Um, so we're only really limited to uh, clear summer days. Um, the surface waters, on the other hand, are very dynamic, often change multiple times in, in a single day. So to get a better understanding of you know the surface waters dynamics of high priority coastal zones uh, and to provide more rapid information between shorter intervals, uh, we need even higher temporal resolution data sets than Sentinel-2, for example. Um, so what we decided to do uh, was we, we were looking for, a, you know, a, a satellite imagery provider that could, you know, had, uh, you know, adequate temporal resolution, but also spatial resolution. We, we wanted to get, obviously, as, as high resolution as we could. Um, and so at the time, um, during phase phase one, what we landed on was planet scope imagery. Um, and this is on the right here is an example of, uh, you know, this is a single week um, in um, August of 2020 that, uh, you know, has uh, a collection almost every every day. Um, and, you know, and it's actually in some of these areas or in some of these days that it's showing, it actually has multiple collections per day. Um, and I will mention that this was out actually tasking and this is before planet put um, up a lot more satellites recently so this is just a standard collection uh, you know with priority potentially priority tasking um, and the new satellites that are up we can get uh you know potentially multiple um measurements um per day um and so you know, you know we were a little bit cautious i'll say at first about using planet imagery um so what we did is you can see in the bottom left hand there we wanted to look at the signal to noise ratio to make sure we were going to be able to really pull out some of these uh water clarity parameters that we we were hoping to um and then as you can see in the bottom left there there is um uh, there are some differences in the signal to noise ratio um but there are also a lot of similarities um so so we proceeded um down that road to to uh, you know, create these water clarity surface water products um, from uh, these high resolution planet scope images. Um, and so I'll hand it back over to Ben to talk about a little bit how we did that. Thanks. Yeah, so I'll just give a little more on the technical side. Uh, because of that similar signal to noise ratio between Sentinel 2 and planet scope dove satellites, um, we evaluated 
uh, the transferability performance of that particle backscatter index um, for these sensors. Um, so we compared the reflectance response of the four comparable visible and near infrared bands over um, uh, safety sound, Alaska over water uh, during a coinciding overpass uh, between Sentinel-2 and PlanScope uh, that were acquired on June 7, 2020. Um, so for evaluation, we performed the same atmosphere correction uh, on both sets of imagery using sort of modifications to traditional ocean color atmospheric al uh, correction algorithms, uh, where we sort of, we would consider Raleigh and aerosol corrections to derive the water re leaving reflectance property for each pixel and the apparent remote sensing reflectance property. So we can actually able to calculate these water quality parameters for evaluation. Uh, overall, we found Planetscope and Sentinel-2 showing strong positive correlations over water with respect to spectral response, um, with Planetscope pixels being a little more saturated relative to Sentinel-2. Um, however, through a method called a bandpass adjustment, we're able to derive coefficients for each Planetscope to uh, Planetscope band so that they're uh, a little more closely corresponding uh, or matching Sentinel-2 band reflectances. Uh, for example, on the bottom right there, you see um, the four band pan adjustment when just applying the backscatter to Sentinel-2 imagery after atmosphere correction. It's almost seeing about a 90% difference uh, with bet between PlanScope and Sentinel-2 derived uh, BBP. However, after vicarious calibration uh, through band pass adjustment, a significant reduction in BBP differences were observed. And um, th that can sort of also just be attributed to the sort of the, the differences in signal to noise ratios uh, that, that Dave kind of went over. Uh, so this sort of, yeah, can you, uh, next slide, please. Yep. So this research uh, in phase one sort of simulated our capacity to generate feasible water clarity products using this high resolution planet scope imagery. Um, and the focus service to be provided in the upcoming SBIR phases um, is sort of this continuous high resolution daily monitoring of surface water conditions uh, targeted for these high priority coastal survey zones in order to sort of mitigate some of the unknowns associated with optimal surface water conditions uh, for hydrographic surveying. Um, and as been mentioned, you know, we're, we're, we're moving into, into phase two of our research and, and really honing in on, on that service and, and product um, side of, of what our phase one research will be, um, you know, um, and, Primarily, it's for optimized image tasking for survey hydrographic survey planning. Um, looking at using uh, a host of different satellite providers that you can see in the in the left hand side here. Um, you know, looking at uh, SAR imagery for things like uh, water levels um, coinciding with image collections, which is a, a large um, kind of unknown in Alaska. Um, Hyperspectral imagery from Satellogic, uh, the new uh, Maxar Legion um, fleet that's to go up in the next several years. Um, also, you know, continuing to use Planet, uh, Planet Scope Imagery, SkySat, um, and then also, uh, you know, accurate water depths from ISAT, ISAT 2 that we've developed the capability in house. Um, using all those things as a holistic kind of uh, data approach uh, to uh, inform survey planning. Um, and part of that um, is, you know, putting uh, some of the capabilities that we've developed into an ArcGIS Pro toolbox. Um, this is an example on the right here um, of us, you know, Planet has a plugin for ArcGIS Pro that you're able to bring in your satellite imagery directly to um, ArcGIS Pro and, you know, create these water clarity maps directly in, in you know, in that program without even, you know, having to, to, to exit to another uh, piece of software. Um, in addition to that, it's been mentioned also for our machine learning approach, we're looking at all these different ancillary data sets that can potentially go into a model um, for predicting optimal, uh, you know, uh, collection parameters or, you know, times when we should be uh, collecting imagery and which also has obviously has its application to um, on the ground uh, field surveying as well. Um, so again, things look things like precipitation in the top right, where we can see where, you know, we, we, we looked in, at in phase one where you know, we can see when there's some precipitation that we obviously get some turbid, uh, uh, turbid imagery. Um, and, you know, other things like temperature can do the same thing where you see higher temperatures, more turbidity from runoff. Um, and then also, as I mentioned before, uh, tidal um, uncertainties is very high in the region. Um, so looking at things like uh, SAR imagery to uh, 
try and try and really get at some of those some of those unknowns. Um, this is in the bottom right is an example of some different tidal cycles that we were able to capture um, in Sentinel two uh, for uh, that phase one research. Um, and again, uh, the ultimate goal of phase two is to use all these kind of whole, uh, it's a holistic approach to multi sensor data um, to process in house and provide that uh, for hydrographic survey. Uh, making and hydrographic survey planning um, in general for such a highly dynamic region um, like Alaska is um, with, you know, like trying to take some of the uncertainty out of, uh, you know, the, the planning process with some of these products um, and services that we, we, we're starting to develop. Um, and I think so with that, uh, we'll, we'll take whatever questions uh, are out there. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, Audience, as a reminder, we have about uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, please type them in the questions chat box. You can find that in the control panel, and I will read them to our speakers. While I wait for some questions to come in, I just want to also remind everybody that this webinar is being recorded. So we encourage you to share the link with um, interested colleagues. Uh, let them know all about T Carta's work. Uh, you could find the recording on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. And it looks like we've got a question. Let me see what it is. Hey, Lisa, says. I was going to ask a quick question if I could to get things sure. kicked off. Is that okay? Absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to, to ask you guys, thank you very much again for the presentation. But I wanted to see, do you have a, uh, any thoughts for how this might be used for uh, in a predictive sense in the future? Do you think you'll be able to get to that point where you can start to predict what turbidity will be using the uh -huh. algorithms that you have? So that that is a it's a, it's a that's a good question, um, and that obviously that's the ultimate goal of what we would like to do. Um, and I think we can produce uh, you know some some tools to get at that question. Um, ultimately, this is there's so many variables that go into predicting uh, you know turbidity as a whole that I don't know if we'll ever come to a hundred percent solution. But I think we can provide uh, you know products um, and services that can can help get at that question. Um, or predicting those things as much as we can. Awesome. All right. Well, we did get a question um, in, and I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. Uh, this question says, I appreciate the context for how these capabilities could inform hydro planning. If there's time, could the speakers elaborate a bit more on what parameters they collected through SDB uh, would be compared Post surveys when multi beam sonar data are processed. Um, so that's actually something I, that we didn't go into, uh, but that is part of a little bit part of our phase two as well. We're looking at um, we have a, a hydrographer joining our, our team as part of um, as part of our our team for for phase two um, and specific to hydro planning. Um, we're currently go assessing. Um, what those those similarities might be. Obviously, the SDB or satellite drive bathymetry would be used more as a um, as a reconnaissance tool, um, or as you know, as a, again as as kind of a planning uh, tool for the surveys, or as a gap filling uh, measure for where the sur surveys potentially can't produce data. Um, but we don't have we don't have an answer to that question currently. But that is something that we we are working on. Great. Um, the next question asks, would you guys consider using um, unmanned airships as aircraft platforms? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, ideally we could, we could, we would love to use some of that, that, um, that data. I think that would, that would, could filter in directly with uh, some of the other, you know, satellite providers that, you know, that that's not necessarily we're not necessarily limiting ourselves to just satellite imagery. Um, we would be uh, definitely interested in using those things, but we currently don't have the capability um, for, for unmanned uh, surveys at, as it is right now. Uh, but obviously that data is extremely valuable and we would uh, be happy to uh, evaluate some of that data and, and look at that for what, what we can use that for. Great. Um, another question, or actually comment, says, hello, I am the PM slash COR for both of the projects you presented and thrilled to see your process. Are you able to share any of the SDB products with me? And 
I can share that information offline and you guys can communicate with each other. Yeah, that would be great. I will say our current uh, SCB that we have produced is is, is limited um, at this point, but we do have um, some of those products in the work and we'd be happy to, to show those off. Excellent. Um, another person asked, sorry, I missed the biggest part. Um, oops, missing that question. Give me one moment. Uh, sorry, I missed the biggest part of your presentation. What has been the variability cycle you noticed for clarity? Has it been due title regime or seasonability? Um, ben, I don't know if you want to tackle that one. So yeah, it's number one. Yes, it's definitely seasonal. Um, uh, and to we've only we're only looking at particle backscatter so that's pretty much everything that's in the water column uh, we have we're not deriving a uh, specific uh, indices like CDOM or chlorophyll so uh, we can't really tell what's exactly in the water or what's really driving what's in the water um, but we can sort of get a an estimate of how much of of what's what's in there compared to clear waters for example um, and I will say too that uh, Part of phase two, we're going to look more into uh, if, if hopefully, if we, if we can get at some of those questions, if it is linked to tidal cycle more, or the or precipitation or temperature runoff. Um, that's hopefully part of, part of what we can get at and a question that we can answer with phase two. Excellent. Next person asks, what is your typical payload weight? Um. So we're not actually designing uh, sensors, uh, so I, I I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you know, we, we I will say that we we use all different types of satellites, all the way from you know, the big bus bus size satellites to the CubeSats, like Planet Scope. Um, so um, really, all 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 sizes so far. All right. Um, next question. Great talk. Thank you. I'm interested in using. I set two for estimating seed points. How do you estimate the bathom sorry, I'm butchering this, bathometry from I set two subsurface photons? How do you identify the subsurface photons? Thank you. Um, so that that technology was uh, developed as part of our NSF phase two XBIR grant. Um, essentially, we, we've in, in house we've developed some technology uh, to take those photon returns, and we have a machine learning approach that can extract those, um, you know, from from corrected uh, photons, so that we're extracting uh, both the water surface and then those subsurface uh, returns to get accurate data. So, you know, we've um, we're, we're that is again that is also a part of uh, kind of what we want to do in phase two is a further assessment of those tests, um, so that we know that when we derive those points in Alaska that we are we know those are true depths. Um, but we have currently uh, you know validated those versus uh, a lot several different uh, multi-beam and airborne LIDAR bathymetry surveys uh, all over the world. Okay. Uh, next question. Are there local measurements of opportunity that would be useful to improve slash validate your products? You go for that one, Ben. Yes, absolutely. Um, like I like I said, we're doing atmospheric correction and even validating our water quality products with institute data. We could come up with you know AOI specific models for other water quality indices like CDOM and chlorophyll, uh, so we can actually tell what's in the water. Um, so right now, like I said, we're just looking at the particle backscatter in the water, but if we actually had some you know corroborative in C2 water quality parameters data, we could actually uh, calibrate our satellite imagery to a specific water quality model. Awesome. Uh, next question, and it says, uh, thank you for your talk. At what ocean depths are you able to reliably capture data via the particle backscatter imaging method, i.e., how deep is too deep? Yeah, so we're just looking at the what's coming off of the from the particle backscatter index is just from the surface waters, um, and depending on the wavelength, um, it's gonna the, the the penetration depth is is variable. It's dependent on the wavelength. Uh, red red will penetrate deeper than the blue, but we're just we're mostly just looking at the surface the surface waters. Oops, excellent. 
Well, it looks like that might be the last question. I'll, I'll give the audience a second to add anything else they'd like to the chat box, but, um, oh, we just got one. Uh, thank you. As a follow-up to the ISIS at two question, is the machine learning approach proprietary? If not, can you tell which one you see, you use? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, that is proprietary. Uh, yeah, we, we, we developed that methodology in-house as part of that, as I mentioned, the NSF grant, that's part of our, our internal workflow. Okay, and we do add another question. Uh, do you have a big bill for computation like AWS for data analysis? Um, I don't know, Ben, you wanna to touch on how we're, how we're doing that? Um, as far as plant scope imagery uh, processing in house, as we, I mean, plant imagery is uh, expensive and cumbersome, um, but we, ha yeah, we haven't had too much of uh, taxing uh, in house processing. We have internal servers that allow us to sort of do a lot of this processing in house. Okay. Well, good. I think, I think that might be our last question. Not sure. These have been wonderful questions. I appreciate everybody asking them and to David and Ben for, for answering them. Um, did you have any last comments before we sign off? Uh, no, I'm just think thanks everyone for, uh, for uh, watching today. Uh, we're really excited about where, where this technology can go um, and kind of excited for the future developments of it. Um, and again, if, if anyone you know has any questions or anything, our emails are on the screen right now. Um, you know, reach out with uh, reach out to us. We'd love to you know uh, potentially collaborate on on some things if we can. Um, uh, we're open to to all kinds of, uh, of of that collaboration. Um, I will say also we do have uh, some Esri story maps on our website. Um, tcarter.com that show uh, some of some of the some of these products and probably potentially a little bit more detail um, but then also there's one of um, the project trident um, as well as well as along uh, some of our other products and services that we we provide at tcarta um, so those um, may be of interest as well excellent well i want to thank you both for sharing your work with us today and also derek thank you and the NOAA technology partnerships office for organizing the Innovator Series and inviting such great speakers. You guys did a great job. Uh, and also to the audience, I'm so glad that you joined us today. Uh, NOAA Central Library is proud to present the work of the NOAA community and its partners, and we hope to see you again. So be well. <laughs>